Good afternoon. Modulator, downer lady. Should I whisper? Welcome, especially to our guests. Uh, we have some students from Petaluma who are here, and are there any students from the ranch? Oh, the kids, students from the ranch were going to come, but didn't come. But we have a full house. I would like to thank the visitors from the community who've come. Um, you always bring with you your uh, sensibilities. Um, and we're especially happy this year because we have more students who are able to share in what we have to share with them and with you. We also have some very special people with us today. Um, as you know, um, today is what? Speak. The 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And um, we're privileged among our speaker, but also to have Lillian Judd with us who is um, a good, solid 91 years old. She was 21 when Auschwitz was liberated. She's originally from uh, an area in the Carpathian Mountains, right? And um, we're very excited because later on in the, in the semester, she's going to come and visit with the students. But Lillian is a survivor of Auschwitz and an iconic figure will uh, be able to show you a photograph of Lillian when she arrived at Auschwitz. A uh, very sad time for her, but one that helps us remember how closely connected we are to people who had this experience. We also have some, I guess Hans is not here, Miriam Dragay, who was also a child during the Holocaust. Um, and is a member of our Alliance board, which we are thrilled with. We have members of the Alliance. They're the people who help us make sure that this course goes on year after year. And they're very generous with their time, their talent, and their treasure. Uh, but mostly time and talent. We rely on other people for the treasure. Um, and I'm glad to see you all. And it's also my pleasure um, to um, introduce our speaker for today, Paul Schwartzbart. He was born in Vienna in 1933. Figure out on your fingers. He's the only child of Sarah and Friedrich Schwartzbart. His family lived in Vienna and had done so since the 18th century, and his father worked at an import export company. His mother was a trained hat maker something that uh, I have a grandmother who shared that ability. But she stayed at home with Paul. The family left Vienna for Cologne in Germany when Paul was five years old. And from there, his father snuck across the border to Belgium. Paul and his mother were caught on their first illegal attempt to join his father in, in Belgium, but they succeeded a second time. In May of 1940, Paul's father was arrested and sent to a labor camp. Paul and his mother remained in Belgium where she worked for a Belgian family. In 1943, a member of the Belgian underground approached Paul's mother and offered to take Paul to safety. She agreed and Paul was sent away under the surname Eckstein, the name of the family his mother worked for. Paul spent the rest of the war in a Belgian a Catholic home for boys in Gemogna, Belgium. Though many boy, Jewish boys were hidden there, Paul thought he was the only one. After liberation, he returned home and found his mother still living there, waiting for Paul and his father, father to return. Paul's beloved father never returned. Sadly, he was murdered at Buchenwald concentration camp two months before it was liberated by American troops in April 1945. You'll learn these facts again, uh, facts uh, that 
shape and make someone who he is. Um, we're delighted to have Paul come back again. Paul and his wife Sherry have become very special friends of the lecture and also of myself, the lecture series. Paul has shared his very special insight with students for 10 years. And each time, students are deeply touched by his story and his um, wonderful spirit. Uh, we're going to see a film, and then after the film, um, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Paul, but first the film. Can someone get the lights up there? Thank you. Many of my fellow children, many did not escape and were brutally put to death or tortured. It is beyond imagination. We, the German Bureau and Chancellor, and the British Prime Minister have had a further meeting today. We regard the agreement signed last night as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. I know that it happened. I know that I was involved in it. I know that I had to go into hiding to escape. <laughs> I prayed very hard for my parents, my mother and my father, the, the teachers and, and the, the other children. I prayed that none of us would have to die or be hurt before it was over. World War II, and Europe was filled with rage and madness and killing. But in the Ardennes forest of Belgium, there was a place of refuge. Tucked away in the small village of Gemoigne was the children's home of Queen Elizabeth. Here, sanctuary was offered to 83 Jewish boys. Sanctuary from the persecution of Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany and the evil of the final solution. Four decades later, in the spring of 1988, the children returned to a reunion, men in midlife with their families and friends, to greet and embrace each other and the people who were their saviors. This is the story of one of the children who was saved, Paul Schwartzbart of San Rafael, California, teacher, father, survivor, Jew. All that he is was shaped by what happened 50 years ago to a frightened little boy when hell opened up and claimed him. And I can only forgive things that were done to me. I shall never, I can never forgive what was done to my father and to the rest of my family. Only they can forgive that. I cannot. March 13, 1938, Vienna, once the capital of an empire of kings and queens. This historic city is now the center of the Anschluss, the Nazi annexation of Austria and where Adolf Hitler returns in triumph to the land of his birth. It was here as a young man that he suffered humiliation and failure as a would-be artist, and where he began to nurse his hatred for the Jews. It is also one month before the fifth birthday of Paul Schwartzbart, the only child of Friedrich and Sarah Schwartzbart, 
Austria is the land of their birth in a Jewish family heritage which dates to the 1700s. They have prospered in a country where 200,000 Jews not only made their home, but helped to define the culture. The Schwarzbart family is as much Austrian as it was Jewish. Both of Paul's grandfathers died fighting for Austria in World War I. Now, if Hitler can have his way, the thousand-year tradition of Austria's Jews is to be obliterated from history. One morning, uh, my parents were standing at the window looking rather shook up. And uh, I remember going to the window, looking out and seeing this strange, huge flag, a red flag with a white circle and a strange-looking cross in the middle. So uh, overnight, uh, the Austrian flag had been taken down and the uh, Nazi German flag had been put up with a swastika. And this is how quickly it happened. In Austria's new Nazi regime, the Jews are an enemy of the state. Paul's father had his job taken away and the family apartment was confiscated and given to a Nazi family. Austria, the land of Strauss and the Waltz, is now a land of violence and intimidation, even for children. Children I'd grown up with, and good friends. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, we're wearing the button with a swastika in their lapels and telling me, uh, dirty little Jew, to get off the sidewalk and walk in the gutter where I belonged. The sound of breaking glass gave the name to the night of November 9th and 10th, 1938. Kristallnacht, the rampage of terror and destruction directed against the Jews in every corner of Germany and Austria. The Nazi brown shirts were avenging the death of a German diplomat killed by a Jew. When the rampage had ended, the cold November sun revealed over 7,000 Jewish homes and businesses plundered, 300 synagogues put to the torch, close to 100 Jews killed and 20,000 arrested and deported to concentration camps. In the last days of 1938, as many Jews before them were forced to do, the Schwarzbarts and other family relatives fled their homes, leaving behind everything they once cherished, leaving Austria forever. All because we were Jews. In late winter of 1938, the Schwarzbarts smuggled themselves out of Austria through Germany and into Belgium. They are in search of visas for the United States. They find a small apartment in Brussels. It is a Jewish neighborhood, and life is hard. I remember next door there was a, a, a woman who sold, uh, down below the next door, she sold uh, coal and vegetables. And occasionally she would uh, sell my mother some rutabaga or potatoes or sometimes the leftovers from it, whatever my mother could afford to pay for, but she always managed to cook it. I have disliked rutabaga ever since. I don't think I want to look another one in the face, but it, uh, it kept us alive. Again and again, Paul's father calls on the American embassy, but the visas never seem to come. Refugees are not able to obtain work permits, but Paul's mother finds illegal work as a housekeeper. As a result, Paul and his father spend many days together. Neither would know just how precious their time together would be. World War II begins in September of 1939. Poland is invaded. And as Hitler's armies rage on, a young boy and his parents in Brussels try as best they can to lead normal lives. The closeness between a father and son grows stronger. I, I remember an enormous love uh, for me, and which I returned. I remember an enormous love for my mother, which set a marvelous example for me both as husband and father. And uh, this is really what is foremost in my, my memory. Now, almost a half century later, in the same Brussels neighborhood, other memories of a past filled with joy and regret are resurrected. The family home in a corner apartment building. Paul, now 55, has not entered this place since his childhood days. The little apartment that we rented in 39, it was a, a walk up on the third floor. I feel like an intruder, you know. 
Okay, here's the third floor. This was it. Looks unoccupied. This was our kitchen. This was our bedroom. It looks unoccupied. Looks like a storage space. Is that really how small it was? This door that either did not exist, don't remember. If it did exist, it was not one that opened, because this, this is all there was. My bed was here. There was a stove here. <laughs> my parents, my mother's bed was right here. I always thought it was a large room. It's not a large room. This was our little kitchen. My God, it's small. Stove stood right here. There was, of course, no sink, no water connection. We had to get in the toilet to get the water. There was a large table here. My mother had made curtains for it, so that was a storage space underneath. There were no cupboards of any sort. And that's all. That was the kitchen. Good times up here. Yeah. Wonderful family time up here. I never knew it was small or that we were poor or anything like that. Never really felt that. Good times. I love. You don't need much to be happy. In the same September month of the Nazi Blitzkrieg in Poland, Paul Schwarzbart begins the first grade. He is six years old. This is the school where I met Joseph Campe, a wonderful man, my first, first year teacher, who really taught me French. And then when the, the Germans said that Jews could no longer go to school, he and retired. He would not, if he couldn't teach everyone, he wouldn't teach. Every morning on his way to school, he would drop off a pack of sandwiches for me at the house. So I would eat lunch, or so I would eat. And he did that every day. Just a stranger, my teacher. This was a good place. Still looks like a good place. Kids learning. Friday, May the 10th, 1940. The German army invades Holland, Luxembourg, and Belgium. Disregarding the three-year-old pact of neutrality, Hitler's swift attacking infantry and panzer divisions overwhelm the Belgians. On the same day their country is invaded, Belgian authorities begin a roundup of German-speaking refugees. They are seen as potential spies, possible Nazi collaborators. Tragic and ironic, most are Jews running from the Nazis. In the roundup, which lasts three days, upwards of 10,000 are seized. Paul's father was among them. Well, we were on the third floor in, in our bedroom, and someone knocked at the door, and there were uniformed Belgian police, the white helmets, and a and, uh, civilian. And they had papers, and they asked for Friedrich Schwarzbart, and they said that because uh, of the war situation, he 
being Austrian, he had to accompany them. It was very simple. It was not unfriendly. It was very matter-of-fact. And my mother was beside herself. I uh, didn't know what to do. And they said that we could come down to the police station and bring some things to him. And uh, off they went. This is what they brought the people on the 10th of May, the Germans, the Austrians, all the people of German origin, most of whom were Jews, but they didn't care. They stuck them in here, and then they were locked up in this tiny little courtyard, uh, bunches at a time. I still see them all standing there, huddled together. Everybody trying to be optimistic and wishing their wives or whoever, whomever, well, they'd be all right. And so my mother and I brought a bundle of clothes here and got it through the grill work. And this is the last place I saw my father. Yeah, right behind us here. He's just sticking his hand out, reaching for us. Dismal place. It's dismal then, it's even worse now. He told me to take good care of my mother, that he would be back, but that I was the man of the family now and that I had to take care of Muti. And uh, neither one of us knew that this was the last time. The very day of his father's arrest, on the way home from their goodbye, Paul and his mother meet a woman whose family would become their good Samaritans. My mother went into a Red Cross station to find out if, if there was anything else we could do for my father, if we could find out where he was being sent and so forth. And as fate will have it, we spoke to a woman named Andre Extin. I, I think she just reacted to the way my mother and I looked. And uh, took pity on us. And I mean, as a human being in, in need of, of solace and, and, and help, and she willingly extended her hand. Andre Eckstein, realizing the Schwarzbarts are alone and destitute, offers Paul's mother a job working in the Eckstein home, taking care of their children. The husband, George, is an architect. For the next three years, Paul spends a great deal of time in their house, and a relationship develops into something much deeper. They were not Jews. These people who helped us were not Jews, which allowed them a certain amount of freedom that we didn't have, but also linked them very closely with us, and they would have certainly shared our faith if uh, anything had happened to us. Belgium surrenders three weeks after the Nazi invasion, and life for the country's 90,000 Jews becomes even more uncertain and dangerous. In the apartment next to the Schwarzbarts lives a woman who entertains the troops. Which in this case meant Germans and even SS in their black uniforms, and which scared my mother very, very much, and yet we lived with it. I remember sometimes at night, she would, you know, the, the, the walls were rather thin and she would put her hands over my ears to protect my innocence. Then come the letters written by Paul's father. He is in the mountains of southwest France at labor camps where the Belgian authorities have sent him. Darling, uh, give special kisses to my child. The first letter is dated June 26, 1940, soon after France falls to the Germans. More letters follow and the family writes back. The Germans censored the letters, but let them go through as proof of their so-called humanity. What survives are Friedrich Schwarzbart's expressions of hope and love for his family. This is what he writes Paul. You are my everything, my sunshine, as well as your mother's and the whole family's. I 
I'd like to hold you fast, to love you. Tell jokes with you. But also, unfortunately, that is not possible. Because I'm here. But your, your picture, I carry in my heart. And my thoughts are ever, ever with you. And there are words of love from husband to wife, words of love between a man and a woman. This is a poem you wrote, my mother, on the occasion of their 10th wedding anniversary, October 25th, 1941, around me, woods and meadows, and lush green mountains blooming in the sunlight. Everything so peaceful and in God's wonder. And yet, much, much more beautiful than all of this are you. I should so much like to love you, kiss your eyes, your hands, your mouth so red and find it so bitter to have to miss being near you. By the summer of 1942, the Nazis are after every Jew in Belgium. At first, a deportation quota of 10,000 is established. Jews are told they are needed for work in the East. But then come the street arrests and roundups. Sent to transit camps, the Jews are often beaten and tortured and put on trains bound for Auschwitz. The first group of Jews leaves on September 2nd. Within a month, all 10,000 are deported. For two years, Paul's father suffers in the labor camps of France, where 3,000 prisoners die from brutality, starvation, and disease. Stopping short of extermination, the cruelty of the collaborating Vichy government comes close to that of the Nazis. In August of 1942, even that fragile distinction ends. At Germany's demand, the French hand over the remaining prisoners for deportation to death camps in the East. August 24th, 1942. Dearest city, dearest Paulinka, I find myself uh, going through the train station in Lyon and take the opportunity to send you my warmest greetings and kisses and utmost love. At the first possibility, I shall immediately write again. Stay in good health. God will help. With all my love, your Papa Fritz. Paul's father never writes again. His 99th letter, his last. There are no letters from his next destination, Gross Rosen, or the one after that, Buchenwald. My mother often wondered why nothing happened to us, but I think that um, she simply ex accepted it. Um, that's really how life was in those days. A person next to you was arrested and, and, and you kept on walking. Uh, someone on the street was shot and, and you were not. And uh, one was just grateful to be alive no matter how tough it was. And of course it started to get tough really in 42 and 43 and that's that's when the underground approached my mother and uh, asked her if, whether she wanted to save my life, which is an interesting question to ask her, her mother. And if she did want to save my life, she'd have to simply give me up. Paul's mother, now seeing the Nazis rounding up old people and children, talks to the Eksteins about the choice she must make. When the stranger from the underground returns that night, she has her answer. When she was handed that lifeline for me, I think she grabbed it. It seems to me that she had been probably agonizing over the problem of finding a solution of what to do with me, how to save me. Paul is to leave this night. The Eksteins offer him the use of their family name. The destination is secret. Not even his mother is told. And she got a bundle of clothes together for me. 
some good shoes and some warm underwear. And uh, the man came and she said yes. And we kissed goodbye and it wasn't quite so simple. But and off I went into the night with this man holding me by the hand. And he took me to the train station. The Luxembourg, and he put me on a train and told me where I was going and told me to take care of myself, which meant, remember, you're not Jewish. And then he walked away and I never saw him again. And a few hours later, I ended up in, in the Ardennes, a little village of Jamogne. It is May 13th. 1943. Paul Schwartzbart, now Paul Eckstein, does not know whether he will ever see his mother again. He is 10 years old. And now that I am a father, I'm beginning to understand what she must have gone through to say yes to letting her son walk away in the night, not knowing whether she would ever see him again. and must have torn her heart out. Located on the Samoa River, Jamoigne is a farming village of about a thousand people during World War II, and it is during the war that this 19th century chateau becomes a shelter for the needy children of Belgian soldiers. Named for the Queen Mother of Belgium, Queen Elizabeth, the chateau now becomes a place of secret refuge for Jewish children, a special place in the life of 10-year-old Paul Schwartzbart. I arrived in Germany in the morning and then I was picked up. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't thought about that for years. The Jewish boys aged 5 to 14 begin arriving in March of 1943. They are overseen by 30 teachers and monitors, and by a handful of nuns from the Order of the Sisters of Charity. In the morning, we would be uh, having classes with these various teachers who would try to uh, maintain our education. And in the afternoon, we played. We went out in the woods as scouts, and we built our huts, and we had our, our uh, scouting games. They all learned about getting along, about living with other human beings. Paul becomes a Cub Scout leader. There I was, the proudest can be, probably the shortest among them, along with Paul Joris, my, my mentor, and walking almost side by side with him. I remember always gave me such a, a good and proud feeling. With Paul's father lost to him, 23-year-old Paul Joris becomes one of the most important people in young Paul's life. He said that when I arrived there, I seemed lost and uh, very sad. And he talked to me and uh, it just clicked. And um, that one person extending his hand to me, I think made all the difference. Um, it made some of the loneliness disappear, some of the, the fear. I have an enormous love for that man. The home is administered by Emile Taquet, a retired Belgian army officer, and his wife Marie, a couple with no children of their own. Every night she would tuck every and each boy in his bed and kiss him goodnight. And, and I remember how we waited for Mama Taquet to come out. We wouldn't go to sleep if she were detained until she had kissed us goodnight. The chateau is in a remote corner of the Ardennes forest. German troops are a constant threat. Other safe houses in Belgium are discovered and their children and benefactors arrested and sent to death camps. One early morning in July of 1943, truckloads of Nazis with machine guns pull up to the chateau and begin to search its rooms and hallways. I was so frightened that uh, I wet my bed. Uh, we were on, on thin straw cuts. The, this went right through and dripped onto the floor, which where it was audible. And I remember two of the German soldiers 
uh, hearing it and looking under the bed and then one laughing the other and saying, this, this kid just peed in his pants. And they, they thought very good naturedly, you know, this was very funny. All they had to do was throw back the covers and it would have been the end of fun. One of the monitors, the one nicknamed Mouton, is taken, presumably to his death. But by some unexplained miracle, the boys are spared. Hiding at the chateau means that Paul must take on a Catholic identity. All the Jewish boys do. Paul is baptized. He takes Holy Communion. He even becomes an altar boy. And believe it or not, I was a very good altar boy because this was not an act for me, for, for any of us, I think. You know, we, we lived what we did. And uh, the uh, Our Father and the Hail Mary uh, were learned, you know, in one session as I listened to everyone repeating them because we had to utter these prayers constantly. We had to say grace. And I became a very good Catholic, which I suppose is being a good Jew uh, since... This was a Jew. As the months pass into the next year, Paul falls into a routine that offers some semblance of tranquility. The home becomes a place of beauty and warmth. And there is nothing in these walls associated with, with sadness, whatever may have torn us up inside, had nothing to do with this place. And so as I look at these walls, I just feel peaceful. The landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. The hour of your liberation was approaching. By September of 1944, the Allies are in the process of pushing the Germans back to their own borders. The afternoon of the 8th, soldiers from the American 28th Infantry Division encountered German troops in Jemoigne. The skirmish extends to the grounds of the chateau. And there, my friends and I stood out there with bullets literally whistling by and, and shells exploding, too dumb to take shelter. Uh, not really caring about it. Uh, and, and I think our, even the, the teachers, the monitors, were just as much in awe of what was happening and were watching with us and forgot to tell us to, to get back in. And uh, it came to jeeps with, the, with their antennas, which we thought were fishing poles, and uh, the boys got out and stood out in, in the open shooting back. By late afternoon, the encounter is over. The Americans move the Germans into further retreat. The village of Jemwanya is liberated. So is the children's home of Elizabeth. All 83 Jewish boys survive. For what it did for us, it was an immense fortress. A refuge, place of learning, place to grow up. Now 11 and a half, Paul receives permission from Madame Teke to leave the chateau. On October 30th, he says goodbye, and with hope, his only companion, sets out for the old Brussels neighborhood in search of his mother. She always said that she did not want to give up this apartment because that was the one place where my father knew that he could find her, and, and I too, after I went away, I, I, I would come back to that. And that's, that's why she said she stayed, but she lived in fear throughout the war every minute. On a familiar street, hope becomes reality. After almost two years, Paul finds once again the soft embrace of his mother. When I saw my mother at a distance, um, I recognized her, of course, immediately, and she me and we start running toward each other, um, almost like in a movie. And I, I was calling out Muti, which is what I called her. And the fir one of the first things I said to her was, oh God, I, in broken German, I was so homesick for you. And we just hugged. Uh, one of the things she said to me was that, you know, we, we can wait for Papa's return together. And so we started waiting and inquiring, filling out forms, trying to find out where he was and when he would be coming home.
There were two rows of bodies stacked up like cordwood. They were thin and very white. Murder had been done at Fugenwald. God alone knows how many men and boys have died there during the last 12 years. The journey of Paul's father ends in the concentration camp of Buchenwald, where Nazi cruelty survives even while its army crumbles. It is here where Friedrich Schwarzbart dies. There is an epilogue to the story of Friedrich Schwarzbart, and it is found here in the Brussels office of the Belgian Ministry of Justice, in a series of rooms, row upon row of Nazi records, itemized ledgers of the cold arithmetic of life and death. These are all the Jews who were deported out of Belgium. Paul comes here out of curiosity, looking for his personal history in the code books of the underground. But records keeper Claire Beret helps him discover other information. Since 1960, Paul has known for certain that his father is dead. But it is only here and now that he learns how he died. Yes. Here's my father. He entered Buchenwald on the 10th of February, 45, coming from the camp of Gross Rosen with his number, 124951, and that he died there one week or eight days later. It says died, I always wonder why they don't say murdered. This is so chilling that there are just no words for it. I know all these things exist, but to see your own father's life. Little slips of paper from German registers, you know. has all the information. It's incredible. Oh my God. That's how I remember him. To this, to this march, dear Lord, he was, he was part of the death march. Perhaps it's, it says that both his feet were frozen. And perhaps sepsis means that he, he, he developed uh, blood poisoning or something. The cold arithmetic of life and death. Friedrich Schwarzbart, tattoo number 124951, died of blood poisoning at 5.30 on a Sunday morning. It was February the 18th, 1945, less than two months before the camp's liberation. He was 42 years old. Is there ever a time when I don't think about my father? No, there really isn't. I think about him very, very, very often. He's always with me. You know, this was a big battlefield. More than four decades later, the chateau was alive with familiar voices again. Oh, God. Paul and the others have returned to remember. I've come a long way for this. On this warm Sunday afternoon in the Ardennes, they have come from their homes across Europe and America. <laughs> With loved ones, 44 of the boys return for a reunion. For many, including Paul, it is the first time they've seen each other since their childhood days. These are human beings that, even though we had not seen, for the most part, one another for 45 years, we walk up and time means absolutely nothing. You embrace one another, you kiss, and uh, the glow is so profound and so special. His beloved teacher, Paul Juris, is here. Now 67 years old, he is a professor in Brussels. Oh, Paul, 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 Paul. Oh, he's behind you, he's trying to take you. Madame Taquet, now 87, and a widow. We want to take you. Turn a little bit your head to your right. 
And here is Mouton, the monitor who was taken away by the Nazis. The boys all thought he was killed, but he is alive and he is here. They all return to see each other and hear words that acknowledge the purpose of this day, words that bring back the sacrifice and fear and death. David Inaloki, who organized the reunion, first entered the chateau on his fifth birthday. He says returning today is like finding a family he had lost. And there's no, no border, no, no difference between those boys. They are all the same. Little boys saved. They have grown up now. One of the people who saved the little boys is 66-year-old Andre Herskovici, a Brussels school teacher in 1942. She became alarmed as her Jewish pupils vanished one by one during the Nazi deportations. I would ask why they were missing, and they told me they were taken away last night by the Germans. They went to a camp. And then I told myself it was impossible. We cannot stay like this doing nothing. Others shared her feelings. In the same year, the Jewish Defense Committee was established to save Jews from extermination. The committee contacted authorities in the Belgian government who were sympathetic. They agreed to help provide secret havens, like the children's home of Queen Elizabeth. André joined the effort, and through the Belgian underground, began the dangerous job of shepherding children. And it was very dramatic when I left with a child, and the mothers were begging me and kissing me and were asking me, tell me, tell me where the child is going to go. And I said, no, no. Afterwards, when I was in the street, I cried. But at the time, it was hard for the mothers, and many of these mothers never saw their children again. That's what you should know. The children of Jamwanya on this day also came to honor those who helped save them. They are called righteous Gentiles, non-Jews who saved Jews during the war. Israel's ambassador to Belgium presents diplomas and medals to 31 adults who saved the 83 Jewish boys from the Nazis. Madame Takei is among those honored. <laughs> Paul Joris is also recognized, the man young Paul so admired and respected that he too became a teacher. After the ceremony, mentor and student talk about the past. Um, Paul remembers when I arrived in Jamoigne. With and new in, shoes. In, you in, had new shoes and it was very difficult for you to walk. Do you remember? I, I remember, I remember that because, you know, <laughs> mommy, mommy had to equip me for, yes. for going away forever. Yes. So I had good shoes on. Mm -hmm. Became good friends. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And then you became my godfather. <laughs> In the true sense of the word. He was not a, a rational boy. I, I had so some pupils in my classroom who were very clever too, but who, were only, who only worked with their heads. And Paul had also a very big heart. You understand what, what I mean? That's what that was Paul. And uh, because he had a very big heart, uh, he, his eyes reflected what happened in his... Uh, in his heart and in his body. On the way to the banquet, Paul met another dear old friend, 73-year-old Father René Ardet, the priest who made Paul an altar boy. He was our father with a capital F, and he taught us catechism, and he taught us about values, and he taught us about uh, dignity and how to become a human being that matters. Father Arday, now with cancer, was advised by doctors not to attend the reunion. But he came, he says, because doctors don't always understand about God. <laughs> At the final event of the day, 250 people gather for an afternoon of informal celebration. Here in the church banquet hall, they'll share food and drink and complete their renewal with the past. Thank you.
They sing to remember the love of the grown-ups who saved them, as well as the comradeship of the other boys. They sing to declare their own survival. They sing to forget what they can never reclaim, the dreams that were shattered on the night of the broken glass. They sing to celebrate one small, undeniable and singular triumph of good over evil, a conspiracy of love between men, women and children, with two faiths, but one God. It was a Christian prayer, and we, are, we sang this, thanking the Lord to give us food for that particular day. Yes, and we were thankful. It was a real Christian prayer. It was a Christian prayer, that's all. Nous aimerions porter un toast à la santé de Madame Taquet. A renewal of the past. In this hall, Madame Taquet is surrounded by people she cared for and loved so many years ago. In all, she was responsible for 125 Christian and Jewish children. As a family, it had its normal problems. When the children arrived, they brought very little with them. So Madame Taquet had to make certain there was enough food, clothes, proper instruction. There was not much time to always worry about the Germans. Of Paul, she remembers a young boy who was always well-mannered and educated. Madame Taquet and her husband called him the Little Prince. Sometimes I say to myself when I look at you, if the outcome had permitted, you would have been my child. You had nothing to worry about. Nothing would have happened to you. A renewal of the past. Men who had become doctors, artists, businessmen, husbands and fathers stand together on a stage and declare with great pride their names, their real names they were forbidden to say while they were in hiding here. Je m'appelais Paul Extin. And Paul pays tribute to the family whose name he borrowed. Andre and George Extin are dead, but their three children remain close to Paul. My feelings for all of them are total love and respect. They are indeed all members of my, my family in the, in the deepest sense of the word. As the hours grow short, they look to exchange a few more pictures, memories, details, to discover and to show how it all turned out. As though the past was close by, this afternoon of reunion allowed each of them to reaffirm the human capacity for love. I still love my children the way I loved them at the time. Does a mother ever forget her children? I had adopted these children and I kept this affection for them. And I would do for them now what I did back then. I was at the same time very happy to see all that people. And at the same time, I was uh, a little sad because uh, it's past is no more. Past is no more. Little by little, it, it became more and more emotional, and after a little while, it was almost overwhelming. Because all the memories of those days, and, and what, seeing, I kept seeing all of us as kids again. All for one and one for all. So for one day, they have been together again, and now that day is coming to a close. They tell each other, we must meet again. And on this one day, they have celebrated together what they have celebrated apart for the past four decades, their own survival. They have returned to the place and the people where that survival was secured. They have shown what they have made of that gift they were given here, a journey begun in fear and completed in triumph. It's wonderful to be alive. It's wonderful to be alive. Adolf Hitler's dream of a thousand year Reich ended in 12 years. Of the six million Jews who were murdered, one and a half million were children. Fifteen of Paul's relatives were exterminated by the Nazis. 
Fulfilling a legacy offered in his youth, Paul has been a teacher for 32 years. He is also a proud husband and a father. His wife, Gail, is a concert violinist, and they are the parents of two sons, Mark 14 and David 13. A close, nurturing family, they continue the religion of his ancestors. In 1969, having remained faithful to her husband, Sarah Schwartzbart died. Yes. Okay. You know, the French are so proud of their French kiss. Belgian one is better. <laughs> you have to think about this? <clears throat> it's a little... It's very difficult to go to levity after this, is it not? But life goes on and one must. You can all hear me all right, right? I'll just use my diaphragm. Um, one of the things that I want to set straight, when the film was made, I hadn't done all my research, and unfortunately, it wasn't 15 members of my family who were murdered, but 66. And uh, I had the very sad duty of filling out all the papers for each one, and I hand carried them to Jerusalem, to the Yad Vashem, and uh, they are now in those archives. I think Ken Swartz did a terrific job with the film. Uh, some of you may be studying film and so forth, and you know, you know how difficult it is. Uh, three Emmys it got, deservedly so. You know, the film, uh, of course. I was just a subject. I did not get anything, although the, the people who received it thanked me. It was a, a ceremony at the Kabuki Theater in San Francisco. Ah, I've seen the film now. I would hesitate to say how many times, but it gets me each time. And, uh, you know, as I said in the film, I, uh, not a moment goes by that I don't think about my father and my mother. But looking at them, uh, still just twists my guts. <sighs> you must have many, many, many questions. And if you get too personal, I may not answer. On the other hand, I may shock you and answer. Uh, I'm counting on your questions. I have much to say. I could stand here for another three hours without your questions, but I'd much rather have some intercourse with you. So if you would please start firing, let's see what happens. Who will be first? Yes. Have I seen the children of the school uh, many times since that reunion? The answer is yes. And with some I correspond and some not. Um, David Inovloki, the one who was uh, presented as having uh, initiated the reunion, I did not know at the school because he came in there when he was five, I was ten, and you know that five-year-olds don't have anything to do with ten-year-olds and vice versa. I mean, you know, you drop dead, right? So I didn't meet him until meet him until the reunion, and we became fast friends, which is really wonderful. You know, uh, very very wonderful. Um, 
Yes, several times we, we, we went to Israel together for a reunion there, uh, an international reunion of hidden children. We had one in New York. And so happily, yes. Ruth. Ah, yes. Um, as the film told you, I was baptized, and Madame Taquet became my godmother, and Paul Joris became my godfather. And until after the liberation, I had to continue calling her Madame and him Monsieur, because how did I explain to the other kids that this little Catholic boy just got baptized? You understand? You don't always think about these things, but you know, it's a matter of life and death. So I could not make it known, be known to anyone that we had any special relationship. So in 1988, that's a long time after the war, isn't it? The war ended in 45, just to refresh your memory. Um, I received a letter inviting me to this reunion. And it's a tribute to the American post office. You know how we badmouth the post office all the time, but you wouldn't have believed that address, but they found me. And it invited me to this reunion, and I wasn't going to go. It said the reunion of the Jewish boys, and I told my dear late wife and our sons, I'm not going to a reunion moi avec moi, you know, I with myself. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But as I read the letter, I found out in the letter the names of people whom I recognized and their real names. And there was a list of 50-odd Jewish names. And that's when I went, I was not the only Jewish boy there. There were others, each one just as careful about hiding his identity as I had been, because otherwise, you know, what was very important, what was made very clear to us without anybody ever explaining it, I've got to make that, I have to emphasize the fact that no one ever took me aside and said, you must not show that you are Jewish, you must hide your Jewishness. No one ever said that. I just knew. We all just knew. You know, you didn't take your underpants off in front of anybody, which was very easy in a Catholic school. You know, nobody did anything like that. You understand? I mean, modesty is certainly very, very important. And so that was easy. Where was I going with this? Um, well, not a group as sophisticated as this one, but sometimes in schools of uh, younger ages and so forth, I have to explain when I said, you know, they said, what did you mean, you know, the fun would have been over if the German soldier had thrown back the covers, you know, and explored. He would have found, would have found out, of course, that I was circumcised and only Jews were circumcised, and that was the end of that. What we all understood, what I certainly understood in my little rounded shoulders was that if I were found out the other 124 boys were dead too. And the 30 teachers. That's a lot of responsibility for a 10-year-old kid. And apparently we all carried that responsibility and that's why we were so very, very careful about our identities. You should have seen me in, or heard me inventing stories when some of the other kids would say, hey Paul, how come you never get any mail? Had you thought about that? I mean, who would have written to me? No one I knew knew where I was. Okay, so you make up some great stories because kids are tough to fool. You know that, you know. But apparently I was very good. I and whoever else had to go through that did it. Did I answer the last question? Sometimes I digress. You know, teachers have been known to do that. <clears throat> Yes. Could you say that again, please?
what life lesson did I find to be valuable and did I take away from that? What did I not find valuable and take away from that? <coughs> Excuse me. The entire experience, um, both overt and covert, because during the day I was this really happy, 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 happy little Belgian kid, right? I mean, in charge of six other little Cub Scouts, you know, and so forth and so on. And then at night when I got into my little cot, I would cry myself to sleep. That's the, my one time of the luxury of wondering about my father and my mother and myself. But I never doubted that it would end up well and that my father and my mother and, and I would be reunited. And I think it's that type of hope which kept me alive and sane. And it's the kind of optimism that has carried me until this day. Um, Dr. Goodman wrote something really beautiful to me a few days ago when I sent her a note saying that it might be raining today. And she, if I may paraphrase, paraphrase, said something, that's okay, you'll bring the sunshine. And it's with wonderful friends like that, you know, that life goes on and, and keeps on being beautiful. And you all saw my beautiful, sweet wife, who after the mother of my children died and I thought life was over, and some four years later we met and she showed me that life was far from over, resuscitated me and has brought me to this healthy, healthy, almost 82. It's miraculous, isn't it? The young man way in the back. water. Uh, after spending two years as a very, very practicing Catholic, I, I have yet to meet a Catholic here who's been practicing that way for two years. They, <laughs> they usually say, oh yeah, but I, you know, I haven't seen the inside of a church, whatever, whatever, which used to surprise me and no longer does, because I thought that all Catholics behaved the way we did. Uh, went to Mass every morning and confession at least once a week, took communion and behaved like a mensch. That's a joke of sorts. Um, I was never what you would call converted. I knew I, who I was. I always knew that I was a Jew. I knew that I had to hide the fact and behave like everybody else, which meant behave like a Catholic. And that's exactly what I did. So far as the beliefs are concerned, huh, have you ever compared the two beliefs, Judaism and Catholicism? I mean, everything Catholicism had, they kind of borrowed from us with a few changes. When the, where the sound stopped there, I said, you know, I was a very good Catholic because after all, Jesus was a Jew, right? This does not shock anybody here, but you would be surprised places where I've said that where, I mean, the disbelief was unbelievable. I mean, people still now don't know facts about their own religions and so forth and so on. I, it makes me wonder sometime when I think about a German, you know, uh, doing horrible thing to a Jew under the statue of Christ and of the Virgin Mary to Jews. You know, it's not funny, but it gives you pause, does it not? I have a few people are nodding, yes. 
So my faith was never in question to answer this very good question from that young man. Um, I came home. I met with my mother on the street, just as the film told you. I mean, you saw that, you'd say it's bad Hollywood, right? And uh, when Friday came, I don't know whether it was the second day, the third day, whatever. Friday came, my mother blessed the candles, you know, welcoming the, the Sabbath. And that, that was it, no transition. I was back to where I was supposed to be, and she never asked me any questions. You know, the incredible love of a mother, the incredible intelligence of a mother. Um, I have always had great love and respect for women, mothers in particular. And all I have to do is look at my own, and it tells it all. Ladies, you're beyond wonderful. <sighs> Did I answer your question? Okay. So, you know, I was a good Catholic by being a good Jew, and I am, a, what I hope, a good human being today. You know, I might tell you a couple of things. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. Uh, my... You know, first of all, I had to learn Latin. You understand? Those of you who are Catholics uh, may remember that in those days, Catholicism was strictly in Latin. Mass was in Latin. Everything the priest said was in Latin, except when he wanted to be understood and he used French for us. You don't like me holding it? Oh, well, then I'll talk more. Um, so here I am, you know, in the school, I, I hear them mumbling, because I didn't understand anything, uh, these things which were in Latin. I'd never heard of Latin before. Remember, this is long before TV and all those things, right? I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know that I was in a Catholic school, although I recognized those three ladies in the back there in their black habits uh, as nuns. But that didn't mean anything to me. I remember uh, once having to go to a dispensary to have a, a wart removed and a nun did it. But that's not a good remembrance. <laughs> um, but the ones at the school were absolutely wonderful. Uh, so, in the morning we have to go to Mass, right? I mean, that's de rigueur. Every morning we go to Mass. And the priest speaks to all the boys. Remember, we were 125, and there were 30 teachers there, big group. And he's re-explaining everything in French, because that was our language. By the way, uh, my teacher had done such a terrific job laying aside for a moment the fact that I'm super intelligent, uh, that my French was flawless, and I could pass for you know, a French-speaking person without any problem at all. That helped a great deal. So he, you know, he holds up the host. Do most of you know what I'm talking about? At Mass, the host, and that's the body of, of God. I'm thinking, that's interesting. You know, I, I never, up to now, 10 years, never knew that the body of God could be in a flat little thing. I, I'm saying this with respect, you understand? Strictly. But then what does that priest do with it? Huh? He puts it in his mouth and he eats it. Now, can you imagine a 10-year-old kid for the first time seeing somebody eating God? <laughs> Again, with respect, but quite an experience. But you know very well that was nothing compared to what was to happen next, right? There are a few Catholics and people who know about, about it, you know. As he holds up the chalice and he says, this is the the blood of God, and then the man drinks it. That's about when I almost lost it. <laughs> but that 10-year-old kid was pretty terrific because he didn't lose it. He took it in stride. And you know that when our turn came to go up, I had to put God in my mouth, but I didn't have to drink his blood. 
okay? Because we didn't get any of that good wine. That was strictly for the priest. So that may have amused you a little bit. It wasn't not funny at all. But in retrospect, it takes on another life, you know? You know what I mean? And uh, sometime, if we have time, I'll talk to you about my first confession. Yes? Oh, okay. No, you go first. Uh, Um, very well. Uh, you understand the question, right? He has a good voice. Um, there was no transition. And there, you know, in, in the old days, <laughs> the old days, um, trauma was not addressed by psychologists. You know, today somebody hurts his toe and there's a psychologist. You know I'm making fun, right? And we would just said, you know, it's over. Get over it and move on with your life. That's literally the way it was. And, you know, school started again. And you didn't have a minute to think about anything else. I mean, school is serious. And one of the things that made it more serious, perhaps, was the fact that the countries, uh, Belgium especially in, the, in my case, so poor, there were no books. So what did you have to do? You have to write down everything the teacher said to study from and take darn good notes or you, you didn't have a prayer. That's the Catholic side, okay? Um, I can, we have time, don't we? Sort of, a little bit. Okay, I remember taking an exam once in high school and uh, a friend and, and I finished pretty much about the same time and we left and we were walking down the street a few blocks from the school talking about the experience and so forth and we hear our names being called and here comes a kid running behind us, teacher wants you back. And uh, so we went back. And he accused us both of cheating. Now, luckily, my buddy sat at the other side of the room. OK? But we had written down the same things. Remember, in those days, there, uh, it was all essay, huh? You didn't have blue books, but you filled pages and pages. OK, all essay. He compared them. They were literally the same. And then we showed him our notes. And they were what the teacher had said. And we were vindicated, of course. We just had studied it so well, both of us. It's an interesting story, no? It just came to me as an answer to your question. Um, you know, when the Germans were there, people disappeared. No, every day. We were so naive. You know, nobody had seen any documentaries yet. Nobody had heard stories yet about what had really happened, you know? We only knew what had happened to us individually, nothing else. We thought that now that the Germans were gone, everybody who had disappeared would reappear. Well, it didn't happen, but that's what we were waiting for, you know, to answer your question. And we thought that normalcy would come back to the, its original state. It wasn't it, until time went by and we started to be told that what had happened really well you know, not to us, but in the camps and so forth. That's when it set in. And that was a very, very tough transition, if you want to call it that. OK? Yes? My first impression of Americans, uh, that they were giants, <laughs> right? I mean, I hadn't seen men that tall ever before, especially as a group. Um, didn't speak English and they didn't speak French, but we communicated. They apparently all loved kids, probably reminded us of their younger brothers, or maybe they were old enough to have kids of their own. They were very young. Oh, 
1944, these were young boys. Um, and they just couldn't do enough for us, you know, in what little time we had together. Uh, Hershey bars, first experience. Don't want one today, but then it was like heaven. Um, chum gum. Have you ever heard of chum gum? You know, uh, interesting flavors. We didn't speak English. We didn't know that you're not supposed to swallow that like other candy. <laughs> interesting results. No, we thought they were we thought they were gods. You know, I mean, first of all, you understand. No, you don't understand because I didn't say it. Everything was discussable at the school except one thing, the war. The war was taboo. We were not allowed to even mention it. Okay? Therefore, in 1944, we did, in, in October of 1944, we didn't know that in June the Allies had landed in Normandy. So we didn't know that the Americans were in Europe. We didn't know that we were being liberated until the day they showed up, okay? And then we asked what that white star was. They said, that, that's the American symbol, uh, like the German one is the swastika, you know, the Hakenkreuz. Um, and we said, well, okay, good little Catholic boys. Yesterday they were in America, today they're here. It's a miracle, they came from heaven. Do you understand? Very serious. We thought they dropped from heaven. They did in a way, you know, but to us it was real. And the idea that we thought that those antennas were fishing poles was very natural to us. It looked like a fishing pole, you know, it moved. You know, we didn't have fishing poles, but we'd seen some of the farmers carry them. Okay, so yeah, gods. Okay. Now I think of goddesses. Yes. Pardon me? Could you say it again and elaborate a little bit? No, no, because I, I, I had to hide my Judaism, but I never stopped being a Jew. No, I didn't have to hide it. I think that was the difference. I, there was never a sense of, of, of liberation. Um, no, not at all. I never felt a prisoner of Catholicism, you know. I mean, everything I'd known up to that time was pretty well it, perhaps stated differently, you know. Instead of, instead of saying, my dear God, I had to say, you know, God number one, God number two, and the Holy Spirit. I guess that's number three. But, you know, be good to your fellow man. Uh, turn the other cheek if you have to. Uh, <laughs> what's the difference? Call it by a different name. You know, how we don't all love each other, I don't know. So we all believe the same things. Uh, by the way, I'm not a preacher. Okay? Um, each other only if the other one's a woman. Yes, please. Hello. <laughs> I wish you'd ask it differently. You know, usually people say, how'd you, how'd you get here? And I said, by boat. So you took that one away from me. Um, <laughs> that's a very good question, actually. Why San Rafael, right? Well, it wasn't San Rafael. I came to Petaluma. Well, not, not much of a reaction. <laughs> it usually gets a much better reaction, especially when you're this close to Petaluma, right? I mean, doesn't everybody want to come to Petaluma? Yeah, you see the... Um, okay, now to explain it briefly. Uh, my father, we say of blessed memory, my father had four sisters. 
one sister got married and left for what was with her husband for what was then known as Palestine. Another one with her husband came to America. The other two, my other two aunts, unfortunately, went up in smoke. So my father and mother's plan was always to come to America to rejoin that sister of his and her husband and their children. You see? And they happened to live in Petaluma. And uh, my uncle was a psychologist. Now you get the earlier reference. Okay. Um, my uncle was a psychologist who had studied with Freud at the University of Vienna. That's mm, a pretty good background. But he became, I think this is delicious, he became a Jungian. <laughs> so during the war, as many other professionals in Petaluma, as you guys from Petaluma know if you studied your history, uh, were chicken ranchers. Okay? And so and after the war, you know, my uncle and the others, you know, we passed uh, the bar, or in this case, you know, the uh, whatever you passed to become a psychologist again, and he had a full career at the Sonoma State Hospital. Okay? That's how I ended up over here. I lasted in Petaluma about two months, finished eighth grade, um, and that was at the beginning of 1949, and then went to San Francisco, couldn't wait to get to the big city, and went to Washington High and then to Cal. So that was that was the road, and uh, so I, I said it all, didn't I? Did I do it well? <laughs> if I want a compliment, I ask my wife. <laughs> yes. I'm not following. Yes. Yes. Until the 60s. Yeah, until the 60s. We had, I had everybody, you know, the Red Cross, everybody looking, and it was some uh, German attorney who finally sent me the note, you know, your father died in Buchenwald on uh, February 18th, 1945. That's all. I didn't get the information, the actual information until I, I went to the archives in Brussels, but it just corroborated what I already knew. But my, my, my mother didn't give up hope until she was confronted with the actual fact. She expected my father to just show up. She said, I don't care if he doesn't know who I am as long as he shows up. He may have lost his memory and lost everything. I just want him. Taught me a lot about love. A lot. Yeah. <clears throat> so, thank you. Still water? Yes, please. What makes you think I did? No, what I said was that I had the ability, or one has the capacity in Judaism, to forgive any and all wrongs done to oneself. But wrongs done to others can only be forgiven by those. So I said, you know, I could not forgive for my father, only he could. I could forgive for myself. Does not mean that I did, however. You know, I was speaking theoretically. But uh, I think I'm going to let it go at that one. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, how far is Brussels from the Ardennes Forest? Uh, about um, half a day by train, 
and just a few hours by car. Today, in today's roads, not then. Uh, had the area been liberated? Yes. Um, you can tell from the way we've been talking that I have a phenomenal memory, right? Say yes, it won't hurt you. You know, and you can confess it later. Um, but kissing the people goodbye at the school, receiving that one nun's cross that you took off from her chest, you know, and gave me to protect me on my way home. Um, and the time that I walked the street and saw my mother, I remember nothing. Absolutely nothing. And someone once said about a long time ago, why don't you go through hypnosis and something? And my answer was, why? I don't care. You know, and I didn't have any money, so I doubt that I took a train. I don't know how I got from one place to the other, but I did. Okay, and I find it absolutely unessential or non-essential to remember that. But it's interesting that you have little holes like that that just simply disappear. Ah. When and how did I tell my super sons about the Holocaust? Um, throughout their growing up, throughout their being able to understand anything. I never made a secret of, of anything where, where Papa came from. By the way, I love the word Papa. I know I was born to become a Papa and to be called a Papa. In my, my, my latest uh, grandson, our latest grandson, calls me Papa because that's what he hears his father call me. And the other delicious thing is that all of uh, that particular son's, all of his friends, they all call me Papa. You know, they, they, they're walking through a mall. Hey, Papa, what are you doing here? And who's this? And then they tell me who they are. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful. But uh, so I always explained uh, to both boys everything that was going on and where I came from without sitting them down and saying, no, listen to this. Okay, but there'd be a reference to something and I'd say, well, that's because, or, you know, why don't I have, why don't we have other grandparents? Only from mommy, not from you, okay? And you have to explain, you see? Um, when the film came out, um, the boys asked for permission to watch it in their own room together and leave their mother and me to watch it on our own because we hadn't seen it until it was on, on TV, you know. Um, Kron was pretty cagey about that. And afterwards, David, who's the younger one, uh, said, well, I knew the facts, but now I understand the chronology. And I thought that was so sharp. They're both very sharp. One is 39 and the other one is 40, almost 41, and then the 39-year-old will become 40. Great age. We have six grandchildren. Uh, that's the revenge, if there is a revenge, you know? That's really it. Um, I share my story with anyone who wants to listen to it and learn from it. Um, we stopped counting after about 500 venues. You know, I've been, I haven't learned to say no. So when, when the Indians of Wyoming at the Wind River Reservation uh, invited me to come and speak, I said, wow, I don't know any Indians. What a fantastic experience. So we went, you know, it's four hours out of Jackson Hole and they were at the airport to meet us drove us all the way back there, and then afterwards made that trip twice again to take us back to the airport. Um, first thing they told us, we are Indians. Please call us Indians. And I got to the high school, Wyoming Indian High School. And, you know, so I learned something. I learned a lot more than I taught. Wonderful people. They, these uh, were Arapaho and Shoshone. 
uh, two tribes living together on this huge reservation. They were absolutely fantastic. But they just about killed me. You know, because they had said, would you talk to a couple of groups? I said, sure. One after breakfast, one after lunch, one after dinner for the entire week. And, you know, you heard me coughing earlier. I got that there, and I haven't been able to get rid of it after all these years. But it was a wonderful experience. I mean, you know, salt of the earth, they, they just, no matter what I said, they, they wanted more. They wanted to know everything that we could tell. They were fantastic, weren't they? Absolutely fantastic. Oh, yes. You know, after I got through talking to a group, usually larger than this, then they'd all come down and file down and stand in line to shake my hand. All of them. It took longer than the, than the presentation, you know. And I figured that I would be hamburger, right? Very soft touch. Very soft. Nothing to prove, you know. Very soft. Just wanted the human contact. It was fantastic. And they avert their eyes. And I, I asked um, John Yellowplume, our guide, I said, what is that? They said, it's a sign of respect and non-confrontation. Huh? The things we have to be taught, right? Fabulous. They, I still hear from some of them, and they, they, when they talk about me, which is wonderful that they do, I'm the, the hippie Holocaust survivor from California. <laughs> My hair was down in the middle of my back, and, and Sherry would braid it sometime. They loved that. They loved it when I braided it. You had to save that one, didn't you? Mm. Oh. <clears throat> At what point did I accept? I suppose I must have accepted it because I'm living not in the past, but with the past. But I can't say that there was ever a moment where I said, aha, uh -huh. you know? And there was a lot of debating going on when I wrote my book, um, my first book, um, which tells that, the story that we were just discussing. And there was a, that took me two years, and there was a lot of soul searching. And when I did all the research on my family before going to uh, Jerusalem to take those papers and to find out about what happened to all these people, but I only talk about my father. You know, I don't talk about the other 65. I, and I find that when I speak to people and, they, and I say, I lost my father, they understand. You say, I lost 66 of 6 million. That boggles the mind, does it not? I mean, <laughs> I don't need to elaborate on that at all. So I can't say that there was a time but I think that I live, my life is normal enough, isn't it, Sherry, that I must have come to grips. Yeah, don't forget the past, but don't live in it, you know. Embrace the present and look forward to the future. I want to see those grandchildren grow up and have families of their own, if God wills it, you know. And certainly my life has been one wonderful happening after another, if you think about it. I mean, the horror was the horror. But look at how many people extended their hand to me and helped me. Many of them teachers. Yes. 
Do I? No, I do. Well, I do have nightmares, but not about that. You know, sometimes I have bizarre dreams, but, but that's a very good question because I've, many people I've read about and have told me that they have horrible um, dreams and nightmares. And again, I am so lucky not to. But I've been married to two incredible ladies and uh, who made my life heaven on earth. One gave me these incredible men, the, our two sons, you know, um, and these beautiful grandchildren. And along the way, so many wonderful friends and colleagues, wonderful colleagues. There's only, you know, every profession is wonderful, but there's only one teaching profession. And, uh, you know, there, there's a young lady sitting in the back there who graduated in 1974, and we have just re-met, and she came here with her husband. Isn't that wonderful? And, and, and yes, she still speaks French. She does, and writes it too. You know, and uh, there are several uh, friends here from our congregation in San Rafael who had not seen the film and wanted to see it, and I hope they thought the trip was worth it. Um, yeah, Dina? Okay. Oh, we have time? Um, you know, the, the wonderful slogan that had started going around after the Second World War, never again, it's come full circle, you know. I remember, maybe it was 19... 50, maybe 52, someone said to me, expecting a different answer, this could never happen again and certainly could never happen here. And I said, are you sure? And I can, it was, happened to be a young lady and I can still see her sobbing. I mean, sobbing like life was ending. You know, France has always, if we're going to mention France, France has always been anti-Semitic. I mean, some of them are even willing to admit it. Uh, and we don't have to just, you know, historically we mentioned the Dreyfus affair, you know, and Emile Zalo and Zola. All right? <laughs> when I use my voice. So I was talking about anti-Semitism in the French and the camps that they had in the Pyrenees Mountains where my father and so many others uh, were sent. Um, these were concentration camps. They were not killing camps, but the film said, and that was... Ken's research that some 3,000 people died of uh, bad treatment and malnutrition, things like that. Uh, their intent was just to keep us away uh, from everybody else. But then 
Laval so willingly turned them all over to the Germans. So all the Germans said, you know, you want some trains? Give us the people. And that's when I read you that last note of my father from the train station of Lyon. Remember? You have a lot to remember right now. I know it's, it's an awful lot of material. And if you said, no, I don't, I wouldn't blame you at all. Um, that last note, those of you who remember, had a slightly more formal tone, didn't it? That's because he threw it out the window of the train. And he didn't know who would find it. And uh, someone did and put postage on it, and my mother and I received it. You know, talk about good Samaritans. I've thought a great deal about this, you know, and there were many friends, you know, Quakers around the trains. They were trying to do something, and maybe one of them found that note and made sure it got to where it was supposed to go. Um, speaking of the, my father's notes, you notice that I read somewhat haltingly, uh, not only because I was crying, but also because they're in German and I was translating you know, as I was reading, you know, the, the cinematographer said, just take them and read them. I said, they're in German. He said, well, translate them, you know. Uh, forget that your heart is being torn and just read them. So that's what I did. And that's why the poem did not rhyme, you know, that he wrote to my mother. It did rhyme, but not my translation. So how do I feel about what's happening in Europe? I've been fearing the the day, and it is here, and they don't seem to be doing anything about it to try to rectify the situation. I don't see anything positive happening, do you? There's a lot of lip service, but that's all. Um, you could pay me you know, my trip to France right now, and I'd give it back to you. And I've always loved going to France. Sherry and I have no desire to go there. Uh, not only because of the danger, but I mean, if the people feel that way, why should we go there? Danger is not what scares us, you know. We go to Israel at the drop of a hat. It's a different kind of danger. We just came back uh, last July. It is an incredible country. It's an incredible people, and it's our people. So, but the one place where we feel at home, where I feel at home, is here. This is my country. I've adopted it. It has adopted me. I wear the flag. I don't ever wear anything, go any place without my flag. The other brooch that you may see and cannot make out is the Holocaust pin from the Yad Vashem. It is a, his barbed wire turning into a, a plant, a flowering, not flowering, but a, a, a plant making its leaves. In other words, out of nothing grows something, right? So I don't know how detailed an answer you wanted but I'm scared, I'm, I'm scared um, very much. And uh, we're not far away from there. Thank you so much for your <laughs> kind attention. Thank you.